I guess we are ready to start. Ladies and gentlemen, um, let me welcome you here at the Itzevro Institute. My name is Josef Shima. I'm president of this college. And indeed, as you all know, we have today another talk in our public lecture series called Severo Academic Forum, uh, which actually already has quite a history. Uh, in the past, we had people like Richard Epstein of Chicago University and New York University. We had Peter Betke of George Mason University giving a talk. We had Roderick Long of Auburn University. We had Frank Makovec from Wofford College and a couple of other people only in this academic part of several institute forum. Besides that, indeed, several businessmen hiring uh, politicians uh, and people from all kind of fields. Today, it is my great pleasure to welcome here and introduce to you Professor David Schmitz, uh, who is a Kendrick Professor of Philosophy and Joint Professor of Economics at the University of Arizona. He grew up in Canada and earned his PhD at Arizona. He taught at Yale University and Bowling Green State University before returning to Arizona. As a visiting professor, he taught at several institutes, Partner School, Florida State University in 2007. He is author of numerous books, such as Elements of Justice, published by Cambridge in 2006, Rational Choice and Moral Agency, published by Princeton in 1995. He co-authored uh, a book called Social Welfare and Individual Responsibility, published by Cambridge, and edited a volume on Robert Nozick uh, in the Cambridge University Press uh, Contemporary Philosophy in Focus series. He also co-edited Environmental Ethics, What Really Matters and What Really Works, published by Oxford. Second edition of this book appeared last year in 2011. Uh, and indeed, his first book, The Limits of Government, an essay on the public goods argument, published in 1991, uh, combined his interest in moral philosophy and economic analysis. He has published in many journals, including the Journal of Philosophy, Ethics, and Political Theory. Over 50 of his articles have been reprinted in numerous languages. Uh, his current project is The Purpose of Moral Theory and A Brief History of Liberty. Uh, David Schmitz has recently uh, founded and became uh, director of the Freedom Center at the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences, the University of Arizona, whose mission is to promote the understanding and appreciation of the ideals of freedom and responsibility along four dimensions. Published research, undergraduate education, graduate education, and community outreach. It is a great honor to have such a speaker here, and I am very glad David is willing to spend an hour with us now, and hopefully a couple of hours of informal meeting later this evening. David, the floor is yours. Thank you all for coming. It is an honor to be here at the invitation of Professor Shima and the Severo Institute, one of the uh, institutes at the at at the edge of uh, of thinking and scholarship and and just bringing together uh, a world, promoting a communication about, about these, these ideals. It's, uh, it's an important place, and uh, like I said, I'm very honored to be here. Tonight, I will talk about... Tonight, I'll, I will be talking about uh, an Austrian named Friedrich Hayek, who uh, 
won, went on to win the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1974. He worked in the areas of philosophy of science and political philosophy, free will and epistemology. He, he could have been a great philosopher if he had chosen uh, that line of work. But his life's work, for which he won the Nobel Prize, uh, illuminated the nature and the significance of what he called spontaneous order. So the concept seems simple, but Hayek spent six decades working on the idea. So obviously, even in Hayek's mind, the idea, it wasn't as simple as, uh, as he wanted it to be, uh, as he aspired for it to be. So we'll talk about that, the nature of spontaneous order. And one further question, why would this, uh, perhaps the 20th century, perhaps history's greatest theorist about the nature of markets and prices, why was this also a person who said that justice is a mirage? Over hundreds of millions of years, order emerged in the natural world. Why? How? Well, there is such a thing as called the design argument that theologians have, have worked on since the uh, medieval times. Uh, but like most philosophers, Hayek considers these arguments fallacious as an argument that we need to posit the existence of a god, a designer, in order to explain the emergence of order in nature. But Hayek was frustrated to find the very same fallacy in arguments that we need to posit a designer to explain the emergence of order in society. And Hayek said, just as no one had to invent natural selection, no one had to invent evolution in the world of nature, no one had to invent the process by which languages evolved in the world. A language is a massively process and path-dependent process of unending mutual adjustment. It evolves spontaneously. It makes no sense to call any language um, optimal or maximally efficient, uh, and it makes, but it does make sense to say that languages are highly refined and effective adaptations to communication needs of, of particular populations. So this is a quotation from Hayek. He says, social theory begins with and has an object only because of the discovery that there exist orderly structures which are the product of action of many men but are not the result of human design. In some fields, this is now universally accepted. Although there was a time when men believed that even languages and morals have been invented by some genius of the past. Everybody now recognizes that they're the outcome of a process of evolution whose results no one foresaw or designed. Natural selection operates on mutations, making the path of natural selection unpredictable no matter how well we understand the underlying principles. To Hayek, social evolution cultural evolution, it's the same thing as natural evolution. It's driven by innovation in the natural world, we would say mutations, and, uh, and driven by fashion and all kinds of shocks that lead people to change their plans in unpredictable ways with unpredictable results. So the system may be logical, more or less. Most things in retrospect seem to have happened for a reason. But however logical the system may be, that doesn't, that logic does not make the system predictable. The system is, in the technical sense, chaotic to such a degree that even something as relatively straightforward as next week's stock prices will always be a matter of guesswork, even for experts. So you might say, there have been languages that have been invented, uh, Esperanto, maybe French, I'm not sure about the second one, but natural, natural languages have another way of coming into existence. So the question is, given that there are these sort of accidental, kind of illogical accidents, why don't rational planners replace natural languages with rational, logical, artificial languages? And I think you, at some level, you have to understand the answer to that. It wouldn't make any sense. It would be silly to try to replace 
our language, English, Czech, whatever, with a rational, rational plan for how to communicate. We don't know enough to be rational planners of language, and even if we did, uh, it still wouldn't make any sense. You could come up with the perfect plan and say, okay, everyone, in order to, we will put you in jail unless you use these, you communicate in this way. It would be a horrible tyranny at best, and it wouldn't work. There would not be any efficiency to it, no matter how beautiful that rational language was in somebody's mind. It just wouldn't work. Well, prices... Hayek says the same thing. They're like natural languages. And so if you ask, well, why not replace market prices, free floating prices with rationally designed central planning? And the answer is that's not what prices are about. Prices are not about some kind of rational optimum. Prices are about people figuring out how to understand each other, figuring out terms on which they're going to make each other better off trying to figure out ways in which they're going to live mutually agreeable lives together. That's what prices are about. They're a language in effect. So prices are like languages. How do we know how we have a certain product? How do we know how to get that product to whomever wants it most? Well, we could take bids, we could auction it off, which is sort of what prices are like. As we and our rival, our competitors, we take bids for uh, some commodity X, well, then X comes to have a price. That comes to be the price at which it's, the auctions are concluded. That's the price of X. And as with languages, prices enable people to form mutual expectations. You can go to a certain market and find out, well, this is what bread is selling for. So this is the market maybe you want to go for. Maybe you go to a different market because you know that has a reputation for producing a kind of bread you like better or perhaps at a price you like better. That's how you learn what kind of community. That's how you learn how to be part of a community that's good for you and you in turn are good for your community. So prices, free floating prices, help people coordinate in intricate, incredibly intricate and mutually considerate ways as they individually decide what to produce or consume. You can get up and you can go to work in the morning knowing that you want to produce uh, door handles for uh, a construction firm in Beijing. You don't even know that those people exist. You don't know their language. You know almost nothing about them other than when you ship your product there it sells. And that's all that they need you to know. That's all that you need to know. You don't need to know what their religion is, just that your door handles are selling. That tells you to stay in the business. That is incredible, but prices do that for you. Without prices, you wouldn't know. So, it's a, it's, it's a stunning thing, really, when you think about prices. Price signals, this is Hayek's insight, they both enable people to adapt and they give people an incentive to adapt to information that they don't even have. Right? You're making a toaster. You don't really know how to make a toaster, but you get things from the manufacturer, you send them on if you're a wholesaler or something like that, and you know, you know who, wants, who really wants your toaster. Without prices, you don't know that. Okay? And uh, Hayek says, you can be using um, maybe uh, oil will be one of the inputs in your production process. Well, what do you know about oil? Uh, maybe you know that something happened to the cost of drilling it went up. Maybe you know that there's a cheap substitute available now. Maybe you know that political in, uh, unrest has made, some, uh, has made the oil harder to acquire. You don't know any of that, in fact. You just know the price went up, so you need to conserve. You need to use less. That's all you know, and that's all you need to know, and you get that from prices, and you don't get that anywhere else. So Hayek's example is 10. He says, assume that somewhere in the world a new opportunity for the use of some raw material like tin has arisen, or one of the sources of uh, the supply of tin has been eliminated. It doesn't matter for our purposes, and it's very significant that it doesn't matter. Which of these two causes has made tin more scarce? All that users of tin need to know is that some of the tin that they used to consume is now more 
more profitably employed elsewhere. That's why people elsewhere are bidding the price up. And in consequence, that's how people know that they must economize on tin, that tin is more valuable than it used to be. Somebody has a better use for it, so you need to figure out a way to use less. So what emerges from this, uh, this haggling and auctioning, bargaining and searching is prices, and prices are like languages. But the other thing that emerges from all of this is community. Deals are made between two traders, but something larger emerges in the process, a spontaneously ordered community. There's no central decision anywhere about who should produce tin or whether anyone should. There's no central decision about who should consume tin or whether anyone should. And there's no central plan about what should be given in exchange for tin. All that happened is there were some people made a guess that if they would produce tin and bring it to the market, it'll be worth something to customers, enough to make the production worthwhile. And when these people, their guesses turn out to be correct, then a market in tin emerges and becomes part of what makes people in that community come together as partners in mutually beneficial ventures. So price signals, one way to put it, is they economize on information. They induce patterns of cooperation that involves multitudes of people, people who may not share a language, may be unaware of each other's existence and indeed unaware that they depend on each other. So you say, you know, someone says the price of, uh, there's, there's a, a, a labor strike in China or something like that in the, uh, the Chinese tin miners. And you say, what, does that make, what difference does that make to me? I'm just, I'm just a, a humble uh, check maker of toasters. And you say, but you use tin in your production process. I do? Well, you figure this out. You find out and... Uh, you know, you come to depend on people you don't even know. You don't even know. You may be a manufacturer of toasters. You don't know how toasters are made. Uh, nobody really knows how toasters are made. You have the general idea, but if you... Uh, I sometimes ask my uh, students, has anybody ever made a, a pizza from scratch? You know about pizza, a great American invention? Uh, well, that's what we say uh, in my neck of the woods anyway. But I ask my students, have anybody ever made, made pizza? I mean, really made pizza, made pizza. We say made pizza from scratch, like from the beginning. You do everything yourself. And a few people say, yes, what's, what's, what's your point? What's the trick? And I say, well, nobody ever made a pizza from scratch. Nobody really knows how to make a pizza. I mean, you may know how to uh, grind the grain to make the flour but you probably don't know how to grow the crop. And if you did know how to grow the crop, you probably wouldn't know how to smelt the iron that you make into tools for farming. So somewhere along the line, you're borrowing on thousands of years of many untold thousands, maybe millions of people, figuring out their little part that is someday going to help somebody make a pizza. So particular agents seldom, probably never have a firm grasp of the big picture, the whole picture, and yet they manage to come together. And they're all better off as a result. They would be living lives of perhaps 25 years, maybe in caves, maybe wearing skin. Eventually what would get them is that um, they would lose their teeth. I mean, that was one of the limits on human human lifespan uh, for, for most of our history is just teeth. Our teeth don't last. Has anyone ever had stone ground flour? Well, everybody used to eat stone ground flour. And the thing about stone ground flour is it's, it's actually ground from stones, which means it's got flakes of stone in it, which means your, your teeth don't last very long. So, um, so yeah, 25 to 30 years, that's how long people lived. And even that required a lot of cooperation. So technological pro, uh, progress, it extends the frontiers of the possible, like vaguely, roughly from zero to infinity. It, it, it's not just a little bit that technological progress extends uh, our freedom. So to Hayek, the freedom of the few to do something new, to do something novel, that's what matters most. 
to everybody, not the freedom of all of us, not the freedom of the many to do something familiar. Uh, and so he said, it's the freedom of the inventors that we all really depend on, not even our own freedom so much as the freedom of inventors, the people at the edge. So, and the freedom that I exercise myself, right, that isn't the, even the only, that, that's what I was saying. It's not the thing that has the most bearers, uh, bearing on my future. Do you know the term early adopters? It refers to, like, I mean, when I buy a computer or a cell phone, I'm the last person in the room to have bought one. Um, so I'm a late adopter. But the person who buys the first one, you watch movies from 20 or 30 years ago, maybe, uh, maybe just 20 years ago, and you'll look at uh, some actor with a cell phone, and the cell phone will be as big as a, you know, like three times the size of a shoe, and they're talking on the cell phone, right? And the, the movies aren't that old, right? But those people, and they pay $4,000 for that phone, it's because of them that folks like me, 20 years later, get to, you know, pick up something like that big for, for $200 or $300, something like that. So even though I'm not even doing business with those early adopters, and yet even so, they are financing the process that brings the production cost down to a point where late adopters like me get into the business, get into the game. So often technological progress consists of innovations that lower transaction costs. So the steamboat, the railroad, air travel, the telegraph, the telephone, the internet, the barcode reader is an interesting example. Uh, these, along, along with things like Federal Express, uh, organizational structures and business models that uh, make it easier to do business, especially globally. Uh, and in many cases, transacting involves exchanging information. And as the frontier of information expands, the uh, slice of that frontier that a given individual can, can grasp that becomes a smaller and smaller part of the total, so we become more and more interdependent. And the prices become an increasingly indispensable window into that world, that frontier of tacit information, Hayek says. Technological innovation is shocking. It shocks economies. So investments, maybe you once used to make toasters, it was a very good business, very profitable, and then somebody else figured out a way to do it better, and your invention stops selling. And that's part of the business too. It's called creative destruction. So invents, investments that were once good investment, they become ancient history, they become relics of a bygone age, and, and those investments have to be liquidated. Workers get laid off, we call it buggy whips, uh, and they have to relearn how to produce uh, goods that customers actually want. And that's rough. The transitions are rough. But the upshot, the end, is that we're all groping toward heights that are made possible by innovation. We're coming up with, I mean, so imagine if somebody passed a law. You, you're the person that produces those $4,000 um, cell phones that are too big to put in a briefcase and you manage to, you say, I'm a local producer, so let's institute some rational planning here. Let's have some laws that prevent this chaos from driving good producers like me out of business. And so they pass a law saying it's illegal to compete with me. And then 20 years later, you got 2012, and you're still looking at these huge cell phones that cost $4,000. That's what protection gets you. It makes sure that you don't make progress. That's protection. Uh, and this is above all what Hayek was against, is using price controls and, and uh, limits on competition to, uh, to help people out. They don't help. It doesn't help. It helps a few people in the short run, and it hurts everybody in the long run. So Hayek then, he denies uh, that, that markets are naturally efficient or something, or maximally efficient. That's not his point at all. He says, look, human beings are what they are. They're going to be making mistakes. They're going to be wasting resources. That's just the human condition. That's not even a variable, really, the fact that people will make mistakes. But there are other huge variables, which is that in markets, people make mistakes at their own expense. 
their, the resources they have to liquidate and stop pouring into bad investments. It's their own resources that they are having to liquidate, or that's the idea anyway. And when they, it's their own, when they're paying for their own mistakes, that's when they start learning. If they're making mistakes with other people's money, they don't learn. And that's a terrible thing. So uh, there are bureaucrats who run government agencies. There are bureaucrats involved in schools, in large corporations. So it's not, governments did not invent bureaucracy. Uh, bureaucrats are, wherever there are large organizations, there will be bureaucrats, including uh, private companies. But the people who employ them uh, can learn from their mistakes too, uh, as long as those folks don't uh, have uh, tenure or some other kind of system of seniority. So uh, when decision makers are bureaucrats in large organizations, then their focus is not on avoiding mistakes. Their focus is on avoiding budget cuts. And so when a bureaucrat acknowledges that the plan has failed, the, the result isn't that they retrench and they divert their resources to better purposes, the result is that some administrator, some bureaucrat higher up cuts their budgets. So what cuts their budget is not the mistake. It's learning from the mistake that cuts their budget. So it becomes all important for these people not to learn from their mistakes. Bureaucrats experience mistakes not as events from which they need to learn, but as events that they need to cover up. Mistakes are with other people's money, so they learn to say with a straight face when confronted that things would have been worse without their policies and that the solution is to keep trying, preferably with a larger budget. And they may even believe what they're saying. They may not be lying or deliberately lying, but actually they don't know and they have every incentive to avoid learning. So if we understand the principles that drive the logic of the system, we may be able to predict that a certain population of insects, say, will evolve resistance to a pesticide. We may be able to predict that a society that declares war on drugs will lose. But beyond the question of what we can predict, Hayek has a more precise target. No matter how much we can predict, we can't predict very much, but no matter how much we can predict, there's an even more drastic limit on what we can just decide. No one can decide that people won't respond to incentives accidentally created by a central plan. In the same way that no one can decide that insects won't become resistant to a pesticide or that viruses won't become resistant to a medicine. So at that point, Adam Smith observed and Hayek gives him credit for uh, observing, that point is not obvious. There's a class of technocrats, I said bureaucrats, these people don't and perhaps cannot cannot appreciate the difficulty. So as Smith famously observed, Hayek quotes this approvingly, the man of system seems to imagine that he can arrange the different members of a great society with as much ease as the hand arranges the different pieces on a chessboard. He doesn't consider that the pieces on the chessboard have no other principle of motion besides that which the hand impresses on them. But in the great human chessboard of human society, every single piece has hopes and dreams and plans of its own, altogether different from that which the legislature might choose to impress upon, it, upon them. So the system has a logic. Planners cannot change that logic. You can intervene, but you cannot change the logic of the system. You can only decide whether to work with that logic or against it. So Smith's point is that planners who decide to work against economic logic, they're deciding in effect to sacrifice their pawns. And Smith says those pawns are people actually and sacrificing the pawns is something that no, no person of true benevolence would do. So when consumers for example, or work, a way of working against the logic of the system, when consumers are not paying for what they receive, as in increasingly the case in American health care, uh, which is a good system, uh, but it is broken all the same and, uh, and the quality is going down, 
But when, people aren't, when patients aren't paying for the care they receive, the demand is effectively infinite. And inevitably, when the demand is effectively infinite, when the good is free, what is a central planner's task going to be? It's not going to be satisfying the customer. Inevitably, the objective becomes cost containment. Like I say, I come from Canada. Canada is farther down the road uh, to, to cost containment being the guiding principle of health care delivery. So um, folks like my father uh, had a heart attack, and they asked him, how old, how old are you? 84. He said, you're too old. We, uh, we'll do something, but it's important to us not to save you. Uh, I mean, they didn't say that in so many words, but, uh, but they didn't treat him, and he died. Um, in the States, they might have wasted a million dollars trying to save him and failed, uh, and that would have been bad too. But, uh, but you know, you, you go for cost containment, and you will pay that price, that moral price, that economic price, um, you'll basically end up with health care will be like three-pound cell phones that cost $4,000. They, they will be extremely expensive, and they won't actually work very well. And that's, uh, that's the price you pay for, for not having to pay. Okay, so if a given amount of steel can make 100 cars or 1,000 stoves or 10,000 toasters, which way of using steel is economical? How would a planner decide you know, what to count as containing cost? How would a planner decide whether to uh, invest in, if you're, if you're doing a, you know, a big kind of Soviet-style project, do you invest in safe drinking water or do you invest in nuclear reactors? If all you know as a as a producer, is that people are asking for infinitely more than you can give them, then eventually you turn a deaf ear. You ignore them, you deliver your quota, and you pay no attention to whether preferences are being satisfied or needs are being met. So suppose there's a price mechanism, but prices are set by planners. Hayek says, only prices determined on a free market will bring it about that demand equals supply. That's what he says. Uh, point, price controls price floors and price ceilings, they, might, they make buyers and sellers, the problem is they make buyers and sellers less able to respond to the signals that they could and would send if they could just increase their offer or lower their asking price. But if the price can't rise, then buyers can't send a signal to producers that they want more and that increased supply would be profitable. And if producers don't increase supply, then rising demand, real rising demand, it translates into, not into economic growth, it translates into shortages. With free flo floating prices, it would translate into economic growth. Okay, so the central planner could have the world's most powerful computer. Back in Hayek's, when he wrote this first in 1945, I think the world's most powerful computer looked a little bit like that. And it probably weighed three pounds, too. So, so you can say to Hayek, okay, you say we cannot rationally plan, we can't have enough information, but you have no idea how big, how powerful our computers are going to be 60 years from now or 70 years from now. And that might be relevant, but actually no computer could solve the problem that Hayek was trying to talk about. The problem isn't a lack of processing power. The problem is a lack of information in the first place. Right? No matter how big our computers get, we will not know what the Dow Jones is going to be by the end of the day tomorrow. That's incredible that we know that little, but you can make our computers infinitely big. We're still not going to know. We're still not going to have the inputs to put into the program so that it will be able to calculate the price. So, you know. So the problem isn't just lack of access, uh, even. So I'm talking about lack of access. We don't have access to the right inputs to tell the computer what to take into account. But it's not even that. It's that the information doesn't exist. 
It doesn't exist until you get people bidding and producing and responding and haggling. That's, that, was, that is the phenomenon that makes the information come into existence. So, uh, although computers can't solve the problem, Hayek thinks that in a way there is a solution, this, and the solution is the price mechanism. Just completely dis dispersed, chaotic decision making by buyers and sellers can solve the problem. It does solve the problem to the extent that it can be solved as well. Uh, sellers who charge too much, they end up not having any customers. They become more efficient, they get their price down or the quality of their product up or they go out of business. Buyers who want a product, just call it X, but suspect that X is overpriced, they stay home for a while. They wait for the price to come down. When the price doesn't come down, then they jump back in. So to Hayek, only the price mechanism comes close to responding to changing information instantaneously. So the best thing that a planner could hope for if you're trying to figure out what is the rational term of exchange for toasters between producers and consumers, if a planner got it perfectly right, what would the planner be doing? The planner would be setting the price where it would be without planners. That would be what the perfect planner would do. Makes you think, doesn't it? Okay, so in service of the overall project of creating wealth, the point, Hayek is not an anarchist. He says there is a point to law and to legislation. It's to craft a framework so that the market order consists of a history of mutually beneficial trades. So the primary role of law and sometimes legislation is to narrow people's options so as to limit opportunities to, cre to capture wealth at other people's expense. Basically, the point of law is to limit opportunities for piracy. And if you accidentally create opportunities for piracy, if you accidentally, in effect, legalize people increasing their budgets, just taking money from taxpayers anytime they want, well, you will, you will get exactly the thing that law is supposed to prevent. You'll, law will be giving you exactly what it should be avoiding uh, giving you. So that as long as the rule of law can internalize the external cost, the economists say, and steer innovation in mutually beneficial directions rather than directions of parasitism and piracy, an evolving order will be an order of rising prosperity. By contrast, in a planned order, even conscientious decisions by these, what Adam Smith called men of system, are damaging. Now, why would that be? Why are they sort of inevitably damaging? Well, because as men of system become micromanagers, then there's a game going on, and those people become the players rather than umpires. So that you would look at if you want to find out what is America up to, what are they doing, you look at the politicians. And when you look at the politicians to find out what Americans are doing, something terrible has happened in America. That you've got the umpires have become the players. They're playing the game now, and the rest of us are sitting on the sidelines cheering them on. They shouldn't be playing the game, though. We should be playing the game. So we become uh, spectators. So even when they're doing, even when they're making good decisions, smart decisions, and of course sometimes they do, but um, but when they're taking these events, these changing events, and they're responding with little central tweaks, right? Even if they play as well as bureaucrats could play, well, we have to sit on the sidelines. The tacit knowledge of ordinary buyers and sellers ends up inactive on the sidelines watching and you get something that has become incredibly common today, I think. It seem, I think this is part of the explanation as to why this, the uh, recovery in the United States is the slowest recovery uh, since the Second World War. Uh, and the, so the reason is that the 
players who would have been the job creators, they would have been hiring, they would have been starting businesses, they're becoming spectators, they're handcuffed by uncertainty. They're waiting to see what the plan is going to be. Until they know what the plan is, what the tax rates are going to be and so on, they don't even know, I mean, they don't know what the NASDAQ or the Dow will be tomorrow. They don't even know something as simple and obvious as, is their workforce too small or too large? Even that, they don't know, so they don't hire. So ideally, Hayek uh, says, the government itself operates only within a stable and known framework of rules, although that ideal, of course, is never achieved in practice, and that's not really anyone's fault. Uh, but the ideal is that, it's important to say what the ideal is, is that the government under the rule of law acts as a referee and a provider of the rule book and operates as much as possible by an ideal of letting the players play. That's what good referees do. Okay, insofar as society is a cooperative venture for mutual advantage, learning to survive not just physically, but as full members of a community, that will involve learning to cooperate. Learning to cooperate involves learning to become a trading partner. So cooperation begins with having something to offer, bringing something valuable to your community, a way of making people, your neighbors, better off. So clearly in Adam Smith, who inspired Hayek, but also in Hayek himself, you get the sense that the objective is not for buyers and sellers to coordinate on a rational price that a central planner might stumble on. The point is just to coordinate, period, so that mutually just make deals, that mutually satisfying coordination, constantly changing, evolving in response to changing demand and cost, that itself is the achievement. It's not the price. It's the trading itself that's the achievement. There's no need for coordination to be tracking anything beyond itself. So to Hayek, the value that we hope to see realized in a marketplace isn't so much that the correct goods get exchanged and the correct volume of goods get exchanged at the correct price. The valued result, instead, the, the point of the division of labor isn't even only the prospect of realizing gains from trade, the pro that's the prospect of buyers and sellers responding to each other, becoming a community, becoming more sensitive to what people around them want and helping to create a community in which they play an important role. And in Adam Smith's world, this is all about earning self-esteem too. We're driven by self-interest, but even you know, self-interest is not the not the main driver of human, uh, human endeavor. The main driver is to be esteemed, especially to be esteemed by yourself, and not just to happen to be esteemed, but to know in your heart that you deserve to be esteemed, that you have earned it. That's, that's the ultimate good for Adam Smith. Well, that kind of sensitivity, I mean, knowing, okay, so, you know, I'm benevolent, I want my butcher and my baker, I want those people to do well, and they want to do well, but they also want to do business with me, they want me to do well, and the way I make them do well, this is why self-interest is central, but it's not the core, it's not the foundation. The reason I'm thinking I'm appealing to my baker's self-interest is because I want to be earning the baker's esteem. I don't want the baker to be giving me bread out of charity. I want the baker to be glad I came in and say, you know, I want to look at my baker and say, you're going to help feed my kids tonight. And I want my baker to look back at me and say, you're going to help feed my kids tonight. And so we make a deal, we shake, we shake hands, and, uh, and we walk out. We're both better off. That's why it's not even my own self-interest that's fundamental, but if I'm a person of benevolence the way Adam Smith supposes, I do have to be thinking about my partner's self-interest. So that people are coordinating, and that they're coordinating freely, by consent, voluntarily, uh, ensures that they're climbing this local gradient, making each other better off. So from a, any perspective, it should be, it should matter more that law be a framework for mutual expectations than exactly where the coordination points are.
and that's got something to do with Hayek's concerns about justice. It shouldn't be about the price. It should just be about the trading. We want that bread moving from people who are good at making it to people who have a good use for it as consumers. Okay. What the price is doesn't matter so much. Okay, so Hayek says then moving toward this uh, last part of my talk, this will be shorter. Hayek says, one of my chief preoccupations for more than 10 years has been coming to terms with the idea that social justice is a mirage. Now, if you're reading, you know, as a philosopher like me, you're reading this and you're thinking, well, Friedrich, I love you, but this is just not going to fly. But he has an argument. By social justice, Hayek doesn't mean justice in the broadest sense. He means what he calls distributive justice. More specifically, he means what knows it called end state or pattern principles of justice. And the point is, these are principles that treat justice as a feature of outcomes. The distribution of wealth, say, in the outcome, rather than as features of the procedures. So justice, not as making sure you don't lie to your customers, you don't misrepresent your product or something like that, or you don't misrepresent your production cost as a way of getting them to agree to your high price. You just say, look, here's the product, this is the way it works, do you want it or don't you want it? And then when they have full information, well then they make a rational decision about it, whether it's worth the money to them. Um, and if they decide that it's worth the money that you're asking, then it shouldn't matter to some social planner how much you're asking. They voluntarily converged on a deal, on a price, and that's all you should care about to high it. Forget about justice, in effect. So why would justice, I mean, the idea that things should be distributed in a certain way. I mean, I, think, I hope what I just said makes sense, but in a way, the contrary makes sense, too. If you say justice is about splitting the difference, you know, so you both should be better off, but the, you know, there's a net benefit created by the exchange, and that benefit should be split somehow evenly split. That's an intuitive idea too. And that is bringing in an idea that Hayek hated right, and found terribly dangerous. Like the most dangerous thing a central planner could do is say, look, I know you guys want to trade, but stop because I'm not convinced that you guys know how to make a fair trade. So I know you guys want to trade, but forget it. We're going to wait till the trade is fair. And then if you don't want to make the trade, well, that's okay. That's not a problem. Uh, so that's the, that's the nightmare for Hayek, is that people blowing this idea of fair price or fair distribution, blowing it completely out of proportion and forget what really matters. What really matters is just that the goods get, get just that the goods move to people who want them. So, yeah, so I'm thinking that Hayek is worried that our sense of justice, our sense of fairness, it can make it harder for us to live together and make progress together. If we're not worried about justice, then we say, yeah, that's a, that's a good price. In fact, that's so good a price, I'm going to stop buying the stuff and I'm going to start manufacturing it and I'll low the, lower the price a bit. That's a great price. I can beat that price. Okay, that's, how we, that's how we make progress. So, Tayek, if people can't, just take their starting point as a given and say, I know what would make me better off is buying your stuff. Uh, you know, if, if, if we're not just going for mutual benefit, uh, then, then we're, uh, we're letting something get in, get in the way that isn't good for us. So what we should want from a system of justice is no less is exactly what we should want from a system of traffic management. It should be a framework of law that enables, it enables us to form expectations about who has the right of way, who's going first, who's going next. We avoid traffic jams, we avoid accidents. We don't need a central planner to tell us what our destination should be. We can figure that out for ourselves. And Hayek says that uh, justice is like that too. Uh, you know, justice should not be about telling us that although that price is acceptable to us, we shouldn't be allowed to accept that price because it's not fair or something. So that's the idea. So maybe Hayek is reacting, uh, but I think this accounts for his dismissal of these uh, pattern uh, pr uh, principles of justice. 
Uh, okay, so I wanted to come up with a concrete example. So, um, okay, so here's, here's the example. Imagine that uh, in Florida many years ago there was something called Hurricane Andrew. You could, Hurricane Katrina was more complicated really legally, but um, same kind of thing. The point is the power goes out, there's a power failure, and there's people without electricity in this large area. So if these people are without electricity, that means they're without refrigeration, and if they're without refrigeration, that means they're without ice. Now some of these people really want ice to keep their beer cold. Right? And some people really want ice to keep their insulin cold so that they don't die. And some people really want ice to keep their baby formula cold so that their babies don't die. Some people want it a lot more than others. So people start trucking in or flying in even, flying in by helicopter, they fly in ice. And whereas the price had been $2 a bag perhaps, it, the price goes up to 12 dollars a bag. It goes up very high. And one thing that governors do, Governor Lawton Childs did this in, in Florida, Hurricane Andrew, he said, you can't do that. You cannot sell ice for $12 a bag. Why not? Because it's unfair. It's not just. And so people were going to die because of that position. That rather, I mean, rather than buy that ice for $12 to keep their babies alive or keep themselves alive, they weren't allowed to do that. It became illegal. Well, of course, you know what happened? The army stepped in and delivered ice because otherwise people were going to die. Well, it was only because of the governor that people were going to die. The helicopters were happy to fly in ice for $12, but because of uh, the governor's decision, it became illegal to do that, so the army brought in ice. Guess what it cost? It cost $9,000 a bag for the army to bring in ice. Hard to believe, but true. Uh, yeah. All right, $9,000 a bag. Okay. This is a standard supply and demand curve. If you, can you still hear me all right? Yeah, okay. I'll try and stay close to home. You've got a standard supply and demand curve. Here, you could suppose that's your equilibrium. That's the amount of ice that will be getting traded at, uh, at $2 a bag. And then when, when you raise the uh, price to $12 a bag, you would think your supply will shoot up but actually, in this case, that won't happen because the cost of getting the ice to the marketplace has gone up so much because the roads are out, the electricity is out. You can't just make it in your freezer anymore. You have to fly it in from 100 miles away or something like that. So you're, you're, still, you're getting an equilibrium, but it's around $12 a bag. But if that's fair, if you can't handle that, then you impose a price control. So you might say, if this has become the new equilibrium, at $12, then you come here. You say, no, we have to cap the price at $2. When you cap the price at $2, what do you get? You get that much being produced. Less than the, you know, vast, you know, I mean, the demand is up here. So you get a loss. Now, I gave you two points, and the equilibrium, what would have been the equilibrium point, that's the third part of a triangle. So you can represent how much, nothing good can come of price controls. Nothing good can come of. What you get is this loss. This much is being lost by the price control. Those are the deals that are not getting made that would otherwise have been made if not for the price control. Oh. But now I have to correct that. This isn't quite right. This is the standard neoclassical model of the dead weight loss, it's called, from price controls. We know from experiments conducted by Kate Johnson in the back that um, that isn't the way it works. Here's how it works. We were running auctions in my classroom and 
bringing together, how much time do I have? This will just take a few minutes. So we were bringing together, we were bringing students up to the front of the room and Kate would give them, Kate runs, a, she's, uh, Vernon Smith won the Nobel Prize for inventing experimental economics. She did a postdoctoral fellowship with him. I did a master's degree with him, and he introduced us. That's, that's why we're married. So uh, we have our own little Nobel Prize to give uh, Vernon Smith as well. But anyway, so she did auction mechanisms. She came up here, and she said, you know, here she handed everybody a card, and the card would say, well, you can sell a widget for $3. You have a widget, you can sell it. It co you have a widget, it cost you $3 to produce it. You can sell it if you want. Or they'd say, you have some money, you have $12, you can buy widgets for whatever you want, but anything that you, you know, any widgets you acquire will give you $4 per widget at the end of the game. So see if you can buy some widgets. Presumably, if, if your resale value is $4, then you want to buy them for something under $4. But you want to buy at the lowest price you can buy if you're a seller. You want to sell at the highest price you can sell. So we just gave, it, gave them the cards, and they'd, and they'd say, what are we supposed to do with these? And we'd say, I don't care what you do. Anyway, you've got six minutes to do it. And they'd sort of look at each other. They'd look around. They didn't know anything. I mean, they'd be asking questions like, OK, so if, if I buy a widget for $3, and then I get to resell it for, for $2, is that profitable? And we'd say, Look, you don't know whether, whether 2 minus 3 is a, is a positive number or a negative number. We can't help you there. You've got five minutes now. Okay, so these people didn't know anything. Okay, now at the end of the experiment then, six minutes goes up and Kate collects the data, punches it into the computer, and the computer spits up the result on the, uh, on the projection. And you'd see supply and demand crossing. So these people who didn't know anything uh, and, and this is a really robust result. You'll get it all over. You can, do, you can, try, the, you can try this at home. Uh, so uh, an incredible vindication of this picture of the marketplace, of the tendency toward in, uh, you know, competitive equilibrium. When Vernon Smith started doing these kinds of experiments, auction experiments, uh, his colleagues uh, hated him. They said, you don't understand. Economics is math. It's not about real idiots out there in the world. It's about math. It's about mathematical results and theorems. You need an infinite number of buyers. You need an infinite number of sellers. They all have to have an infinite amount of perfectly processed information and so on. And Vernon said, well, let's, uh, let's try six college kids and see what happens. And it turned out like incredibly robust results. You know, do it with people with hangovers. I mean, you get the same result, right? I mean, you get incredibly efficient results. Then he says, or we say, Kate said, now impose a price control. You impose a price control, and then you get this dead weight loss, except for the following amazing um, difference, this amazing divergence from this neoclassical model. If this were like a real free floating economy, if this were like an auction, then these people would get it. They'd say, I'll pay you $12 for that bag of ice. Don't sell it for two. But with the price control, now the sellers are saying, gee, I'd love to do business with you. I can't. It's illegal. I have to sell for $2. When they have to sell for $2, those beer drinkers are still in the market. And that means this is the supply, but it gets sold to whoever. It doesn't get sold to the highest valued users. It gets sold who, to whoever happens to be in the right place at the right time. So somebody says, well, gee, I don't know. I'll sell, uh, I'll sell my widget for $2. And somebody says, I'll take it. And somebody else is saying, oh, man, if you just hung on, I would have given you three. You wouldn't have been allowed to give me three. I would have given you four. I would have given you 11. It doesn't matter. I sold. I could only sell at $2, so I sold to whoever was standing in front of me. So some of this goes to insulin users.
some of it goes to beer drinkers. The maximum dead weight loss, this is actually the maximum dead weight loss, all of this. You don't see this either. What you see is something in between. You see these stripes. Some of the insulin users got in, they got to the front of the line at the right time, and some of them didn't. So you see stripes. So this is the mirage. Hayek is saying it's not fair to sell ice at $12 a bag. And you can think of the reasons intuitively. It isn't fair to sell for $12 a bag. You say, that's called price gouging. You're taking these people, they need the ice to chill their baby formula, and you got there and you're saying, look, I know you're going to pay it, so just pay it. You can argue with me, you can call me names. But at the end of the day, you're going to get out your wallet and you're going to buy it because it's worth it to you. You're not just a beer drinker. You're an insulin user. So get out your $12 and stop whining. And if you want me to come back, tell me if you want me to come back tomorrow. If you don't want me to come back tomorrow, I won't come back. And the guy says, please come back tomorrow. The guy says, the price will be $13 tomorrow. And the guy says, please come back tomorrow because otherwise I die. Okay. For the sake of, that's, you can call that unfair. And Hayek is saying... For the sake of fairness, you are willing to redistribute, in effect, ice from insulin users and baby formula users to beer drinkers. You're willing to insist on a system in which the distribution of this product is arbitrary. It doesn't go to the highest valued users. It goes to arbitrary users. And you're saying that justice requires that, and Hayek is saying, well, that is a mirage. Thank you very much for a wonderful talk. We still have time to debate things related or unrelated to the topic. Um, before we s open the floor for discussion, I'd like to appreciate the help of Ludwig von Mises Institute, Czech Republic and Slovakia. It's actually nice that Mises is meeting Hayek here at the Itzebro Institute. It's, uh, I guess, not a complete coincidence. Um, anyway, if you have a comment, question, feel free to, to ask. Okay, there are some. All right. Got it. So the question is, where do I see uh, the EU going in the future? And I'm sorry, I'm, um, I'm just a philosopher. Uh, that this is not uh, the politics and the economics, uh, the upheavals uh, of the EU. It's, it's not my specialty at all. Uh, I don't know anything more than I read about in the newspapers. I could say just a couple of general things uh, is that um, there are efficiencies. On the one hand, there are efficiencies to lowering the transaction costs, which you do by you reduce the importance of borders, you reduce the importance of local currencies, even local languages, that sort of thing. So uh, it's, it's a good thing to create a larger neighborhood in a way, a larger uh, block of, uh, of economic traders, and, and you lower the cost of, of people trading, you lower the cost of labor uh, moving to where it's most, it's most valued, labor forces going to where they have the greatest value. So that's a good thing. Uh, but the other side of the, of the coin is that uh, you, you have a problem with external cost. You have a problem with people making decisions at other people's expense. And that is something that you want to limit. So if you have people saying, 
well, I've decided to lower my price. Uh, I've decided to lower my retirement age to 52 years. And part of the point of doing that is because I don't have to save for my own retirement. It's the public, in some sense, that will have to pay for my retirement. So I re lower my retirement age to 52. And if it's a bigger public, then then that cost gets dispersed over a larger number of people. So in some sense, that's a good thing. But then the country next door says, well, if that's going to work, then we're going to lower our retirement age to 18. Uh, and that becomes a disaster. So, so the general idea of people being able to make decisions at other people's expense, you can't have, I think you can't afford an EU, you can't afford a single country even, where, uh, where people don't have to worry about what their decisions are costing other people like that, where the decisions they make, where you pay for everybody's decision except your own, you don't get good decisions that way. You don't, people don't, they, they don't know what a good decision would be like. Uh, they just know that they don't have to pay if their decisions are bad, and so they become uh, militantly opposed to people even judging their, uh, their decisions. But the fact is, at some point, uh, there will be a, a reassertion of collective will, and people will say, no, you don't have the right to retire anymore, because the thing is, when you retire, the rest of us pay for it. They'll say, you don't have the right to seek medical care and to pay the doctor uh, whatever a mutually agreeable price is, because the rest of us actually pay the doctor, so the rest of us have to make the decision as to whether you should be seeing a doctor, should be treated by a doctor, uh, and so on and so forth. The rest of us have to decide what you should be investing in, and uh, the rest of us should decide how, how big your cell phone is. Um, and so that is, uh, I mean, obviously, just from reading the newspapers, uh, the cost of the EU has already become gigantic. Uh, but the benefits seemed, seemed to be the immediate benefits seem to be pretty gigantic uh, as well. So, so I'm worried about that trade-off, but that's, that's all I can say. I, I don't know what direction things are going. Okay, two questions. Uh, the first question is about the, the alternatives of civil and common law. Uh, and I do know a fair bit about that. I still don't have an answer for you, though. Uh, I can say that um, um, the common law has a, civil law is indispensable. You're going to have uh, some of the elements of a civil law system. But the common law has at least potentially a, a great benefit, which is that, like civil law, that's folks in you know, Paris or Belgium or Washington or something like that, getting together and deciding what people that they'll never meet 2,000 years, 2,000 miles away, what, uh, what system, what rules they should be playing by, what, what's in their best interest. And, and these people are, are guessing, and, and they throw pieces of legislation in. Eventually, the bill that they pass is 4,000 pages long. And literally, no one has read it. Even the people who wrote it didn't read it. The people who, I mean, there's hundreds of people each wrote a few pages of it, and the bill gets passed, and literally no one in the world, even the authors, have actually read it. And it turns out to have a lot of inefficiency and a lot of waste built into it. Whereas, and you're still going to do it, you're still going to need some legislation. Even a free marketeer like Hayek realized that. But on the other hand, in a common law system, uh, it can go badly, but it can also go really well. 
because you've got a judge and you've got litigants appear before the judge and one will say, he stole my water and the other litigant will say, no, no, it wasn't your water, it never was your water and the judge will say, okay, you guys are fighting, you have to stop fighting so here's the rule, here's how you share access, here's how you determine your property right and the litigants will say, judge, uh, that isn't going to work, here's why and the judge will say, okay, got that, all right, argue some more. Okay, now here's the rule, and then they both say, well, I can live with that. So the genius of the common law system is that the laws that get created are laws that successfully resolve real disputes. They're not imaginary things that people in Washington thought was a good idea. They're genuine dispute resolution where the judge is saying, look, I know what's going to count as me successfully adjudicating this case. Well, it's two things. You guys will stop fighting and you guys will look at each other and say, well, the judge should have given me more, but I can live with that. You can live with that. That's, that's what we need. That's what, we need a traffic management system where you guys know who has the red light and who has the green light. You both understand what that means. and You, can, you wish, each of you wishes that each of you had a, a green light all the time, but it's not going to be that way, so, but you can live with this. And future potential litigants in the future will be able to look at that precedent and avoid that kind of fight or wasted investment in the future. So people will know how that kind of case is going to get resolved and so they'll say, I'm just not going to even get into that position. I will avoid that fight right from the start. So that's how common law works when it's working well and uh, it has a history of working, working pretty well. So in that case, uh, you know, so there's something to be said for the common law but something unavoidable about legislation and in effect uh, civil law as well. And remind me what your second question was? Okay, so, yeah, here's, here's the problem. Uh, ideally, I mean, law should be simple, like your law should be something you could write on the back of a postcard and everybody know uh, what's going on. But the thing is that the world changes, and so you come up with a judgment, you come up with a rule, you come up with a custom, a convention, uh, you know, an understanding about how property rights are determined, you get to say, look, this is my land, I get to put up a fence, I get to put up a no trespassing sign, and that pretty much settles it. But the thing is that the world changes, and so when the world changes, then something that had been a good solution, maybe for a long time, stops being a good solution. And that's not the fault of, of the legislation that was created once or the common law adjudication that worked for a while but you know just the thing is that the world changes and so you say it's it's customary that uh, if it's your land then you are you know you have a certain dominion you uh, if it if it's your castle then you're the king uh, in your castle but then things happen so in 1936 there was this rancher named Hinman and a company named Pacific Air Transport. They flew over Hinman's property. Hinman said, what's that all about? Uh, and so he filed suit for trespass. He said, this Pacific Air Transport, they keep flying across my, uh, my land. And uh, I, I say no trespassing. So they can't do that anymore. 
Now the judge is looking at this saying, are you kidding? And Hinman says, oh no, here's my lawyer. My lawyer says, it's a 2,000 year old custom that he who, I mean, it's, this goes back to Roman law, that he who owns the soil owns it to the skies, owns it to the heavens. So that guy's at 10,000 feet. He's, he's on my property. And so the judge says, well, A, uh, I know what the right decision in this case is. The right decision is that the purpose of property and of the right to exclude, the right to put up no trespassing signs, is that you should have the right to remove yourself from the marketplace, to say, no, there are deals I don't want to make. This is, if this is my body, it's my decision whether to sell it. If it's my land, it's my decision whether to sell it or to give it to somebody else, to give the use of it to somebody else. Um, so that is paramount. I have to have the right, in effect, to put up a no trespassing sign. But the point of the no trespassing sign is not to give a person the right to hold other people for ransom. So you, you're not going to have a situation in which you say, uh, excuse me, what, what's your name? Alfred. Alfred. Stop breathing. I, I bought the air yesterday and I put up a no trespassing sign around the air. You don't have a right to breathe anymore. You can pay me a toll. You can pay me a fee for my air because that's my air. Say, so, oh, you just don't, you're just never going to have a law like that because the law is supposed to help us avoid gridlock. It's not supposed to give us the right to impose gridlock on our community. It's supposed to help us live good lives together, not give us the right to forbid other people to live good lives. So when Hinman and the judge sees that plane going over, getting from New York to LA in six hours, delivering mail, doing things that once would have been totally impossible, and the judge says, okay, so this guy Hinman on the ground wants the right to stop that from happening. To say, I don't want there to ever be small cell phones. I, I want the right to prohibit people from buying big cell phones or flying airplanes. They're going to have to pay me if they want to fly airplanes. Uh, and that would be like saying, you know, traffic lights are good. But that doesn't mean more traffic lights are better. Right? Traffic lights help to coordinate us. But if I say, Alfred, I don't know where you live, but you have the right to put up a green light, red light, uh, you know, where you live, uh, you know, near your home, so as to say, and anybody, okay, the light's red. If you want it to turn green, you have to pay me uh, five crowns or something like that. And, uh, and the judge is going to say, that's not what the law is for. But the thing is, the law, the, you know, technology can change in such a way that something that wasn't a problem now becomes a problem. So the outcome of this decision is the judge says, well, first of all, the obvious thing to say is, Hinman, you're wrong. Pacific Air, you have the right to do that. And Pacific Air went on to become United Airlines, by the way. Now I have to figure out a reason why Hinman is wrong. And so what came out of that was to say, it's always been true that you couldn't, you couldn't gridlock the mouth of a river just because you own the shore uh, and that sort of thing. You can't gridlock the beach by buying all of the land in front of the beach. You have to allow navigation easements. You have to allow, uh, you have to allow people to pass in order to get to the marketplace, to get where they need to be in order to make their communities better places. And so the idea then was, well, maybe you do own the land. Maybe Hinman does own the land to the heavens. But the thing is, once you go high enough, there are, kind of, there are tunnels in that land called navigation easements, and people get to go through those tunnels on the way from New York to L.A., say. They don't get to fly around your land just for recreation, and they don't get to, you know, dump the contents of their lavatories on your land and that sort of thing, but they do get to navigate for purposes of, you know, community benefiting commerce. So it's because you don't know how things are going to change, how the frontier of possibilities is going to change. You're always going to have to be coming up with new legislation. So something like, well, now there's something called, like, bandwidth. 
I, like I said, I'm a late ad adopter. I don't really know what bandwidth is, but I know it's really valuable. And so you're going to get the emergence of property rights in bandwidth. And that is going to be a very, that's a very tricky question, uh, figuring out how, you know, it's an, in the same way as intellectual property is a very tricky question, figuring out where people should be able to put up the no trespassing signs. You know, if you invent a new kind of antibiotic, you put up a no trespassing sign. Does that last 500 years? Does that last five years? At one point, does that actually become that patent? At one po what point does it become community property? Well, these are questions that have to, decisions that have to be made and probably have to be remade. They don't, you make the decision, it isn't going to stay final. It's going to be something that's going to have to evolve as the, as the technology evolves. So. And Hayek is, I admire Hayek. It's, it's muddy. It's a, it's a messy part of his theory. But Hayek says, look, we can't just be anarchists. I mean, that would be nice and clean theoretically, but we just can't do it. Uh, and we can't just be common law theorists. That would be pretty clean. We can't do it. We're going to need legislation. And when we need, when we, admitting that we need legislation is going to leave us open for tyranny. But the fact is, that's, that's the world we live in, and that's the kind of species we are. Yeah, uh, Mike's a, a really good friend of mine, and he doesn't know what to think about that. Uh, I don't know, I don't really know what to think about that either. Uh, I do have a thought about the uh, first question, uh, which is basically, should everything be for sale? And I provoked that when I said it, you know, it's, it's my body. Somebody's got the right to decide whether it's for sale. That should be me. Um, now, but that might not be right. You might say, well, yeah, I, if, if anybody has the right to sell my kidney, it should be me. If anybody has the right to sell me into prostitution, it should be me. Uh, but that doesn't mean I should have the right. It just means nobody else should have the right. So uh, you could ask, then, should everything be for sale? And I would think the answer to that is no. Uh, I think Hayek would agree. Um, I know Robert Nozick would agree. Uh, I had lunch with him at the end of 1999. I gave a, because it was the end of 1999, I was given the end of millennium talk at Boston University, and I gave a talk on the meaning of life because what else are you going to talk about when it's the end of the millennium? But uh, so he... He came uh, and he invited me out to dinner afterwards and uh, he said, you know, the, my departure from libertarianism has been greatly exaggerated. And I said, well, look, it's, I don't care. That's not my problem. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to criticize you. But I would only say if, if any, if, I mean, if, if your 
rejection of libertarianism has been exaggerated, it would surely be mainly by you because you've said many times that you, you know, your, your views as a young man are immature, you don't hold them anymore. So, like I said, I don't care, but, but you said it yourself. And he said, well, actually, and he had a lot to say, I'm really, really interesting, but, but he said, the thing that I really did reject wasn't some, it wasn't some broad thing about libertarianism. It was about selling yourself into slavery. He said, I, uh, I once thought that, well, it, it's your body. You should be able to sell it to whomever you want. But then he said, I realized that allowing slavery is not, it might actually be a way for a country to promote freedom or to be, no, it's a way for a country to be free is to, respect all decisions, all voluntary trades, including slavery contracts. The way to be free might be to recognize that, but that's not a way to stand for freedom. The way to stand for freedom is to say, we don't stand for slavery, period. Not even, not even if it's in your interest to become a slave. Even then, we don't stand for it. And so he said, because I started to think that actions and what states do on behalf of their citizens because these things have symbolic issues, symbolic values, and because there is such a thing as standing for something, I realized I had to give up the idea that everything should be for sale. So that's what he said, and I would agree with that too. I, uh, I, think, I think people, communities do have to decide uh, what, they, what they stand for. Uh, and so there are, there are all kinds of things I've... Uh, uh, Deborah Satz just had a book called uh, Why Some Things Should Not Be For Sale. Uh, and I don't understand, like, why such a cumbersome tale? I, I rewrote it. When I reviewed it, I said, this, this, this is called Not For Sale. Uh, but anyway, she thinks that there are a bunch of things uh, that shouldn't be for sale. And I pretty much, uh, I pretty much agree with her uh, about that, I think. Uh, I think, you know, so suppose we, you know, at some point we decided to legalize alcohol and we may decide to legalize marijuana, maybe some other things. I just served on a grand jury for four months and so I'm, I'm uh, bitterly and vividly aware of how pointless the drug war is. Um, I shouldn't say pointless, but how, un how unbelievably unsuccessful it is uh, how unbelievably badly we're losing that war. But, um, but in any case, you decide to legalize alcohol. That doesn't mean you legalize it for eight-year-olds or 10-year-olds. Doesn't mean you legalize tobacco for eight-year-olds. Doesn't mean you legalize marijuana or heroin for eight-year-olds. So at some point, even people who are inclined not to draw a line, I think almost all of them will draw a line for some. Uh, and so, like, should you be able to sell your vote and there are people who will say, why not? But there aren't many people who would say that because almost everybody can see the point of not allowing people to sell their, to sell their votes. Um, so there are a variety of, uh, of things that you would say, it w we'd be, we'd, we would lessen ourselves to allow those things to be commodities. There, uh, there have to be... Uh, uh, there have to, has to be something at the end of the day that the commodification is for and some ideal that it's in service of, some ideal of human flourishing. Uh, and so allowing all of that trading and so on has to go hand in hand with, with some view of what the trading is for. Uh, and that will yield some conclusions about you know, what you can and can't sell and whom you can and can't sell. Um, yeah, that's a little messy too, but that's also the way the world is. It, it, it's not the case that everything should be for sale. Most things, but not everything. Thank you. Thank you again for coming. It's a, what a beautiful place this is and what a beautiful city this is. Um, thank you. Good luck.